All right, welcome everyone. This is Emily Dropkin at the National Head Start Association. We're excited to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, if you can hear me right now, go ahead and type the word yes in your questions box just so we can be sure everybody's got the sound working and we're okay on our end. All right, wonderful. Thank you guys. Uh, glad, glad everybody's technology is okay. Um, Today, I'm glad to welcome you to our webinar on Supporting Two Generations, Partnerships Between Campus Child Care and Early Head Start. Um, I know many of you are from the uh, Early Head Start and Head Start world and child care world, and, and many of you are also from the world of colleges and community colleges and universities. Um, and we're really thrilled to be able to bring together all these different groups and different audiences uh, to talk about the low-income families that all of us work with um, and want to support in being as successful as possible. Uh, as we move forward today, you'll hear from all the different organizations on your screen. Um, before we get started, just a few words on uh, the procedures for this. Uh, we will have slides available afterwards. If you have questions during the session, you are welcome to type those into the questions box on your screen. Um, we will try to get the pertinent questions as they come up, but most likely we'll take the bulk of our questions at the end of the session. Um, and we, you should now see on your screen uh, the presentation. Uh, we're delighted to be joined uh, by quite a number of organizations. We have Yasmina Vinci, Executive Director of the National Head Start Association, Barbara Gold, Vice President and Executive Director of the Institute for Women's Policy Research, Mary Skirafa, President of the National Coalition for Campus Children's Centers, Sherelle Arnold, who's the board chair for the Higher Education Alliance of Advocates for Students with Children, uh, me. Uh, Jean Bridges, who's the Child Development Director at Penquist, which is an Early Head Start grantee in Maine. Sandy Simar, who's the Education Director for Child Care Resource and Referral, Inc., uh, a Head Start and Early Head Start grantee in Minnesota. And Ainsley Allert, Executive Director of Civic League Day Nursery, a partner of Child Care Resource and Referral. Um, and I just want to tell you quickly, too, the story of this, this family who are on the screen here. Um, they're actually from a, an advocacy exhibit we did on Head Start a few months ago um, about the sequester. And the mom you see there sitting on the stoop uh, was a community college student whose children were enrolled in, in Head Start and Early Head Start uh, who had to drop out because of the sequester cut. Um, and so we're very glad that in the past few months, Head Start advocacy and, and national advocacy has been able to restore those funds um, and get children back into programs, and also to uh, win us some, some new funds and new investments, which are what we'll be talking about today, to expand those kinds of services um, and help just these families. Uh, first, I'll turn us to uh, our agenda quickly. We'll hear from several of our organizations that are hosting today. Then we'll offer some background on student parents and campus-based child care, uh, additional background on early Head Start child care partnerships, and then we'll hear from the models in uh, Minnesota and Maine about how they develop their partnerships, how they work, um, and you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions and think about how these opportunities might be relevant for your communities. Uh, one quick thing before we get started, um, just a quick poll to get a sense of who's on with us today. Um, so you'll see that on your screen in just a second. And go ahead and let us know which of these best applies to, to you and who you're who you are as you're joining us today. Okay. 90% voting, you guys are great. Um, so here we see that predominantly today we've got a um, pretty good mix of Head Start programs and early Head Start programs, community colleges, and then four-year colleges and universities, um, and some other folks on as well uh, who didn't identify primarily with those. But thanks, that, that's great to hear that we've got folks from all our different communities um, excited about this opportunity as we are. Um, so for our first welcoming organization, I'll turn us over to Yasmina Vinci from the National Head Start Association. Yasmina? Welcome, everybody. And we're really thrilled, and I'm thrilled to see that uh, uh, quite a few people on, on the call are from higher ed. 
uh, Head Start has always been about um, new generations supporting the children and the families. And so um, this particular partnerships opportunity and also the opportunity to, for Head Start to work with, um, with the uh, both community colleges and, uh, and other uh, institutions of higher learning is, is absolutely great. Uh, because that is really working with both generations. So uh, Emily came back from a meeting, a uh, two-generation meeting, very excited uh, to hear of uh, the research, um, Barbara's research, and, uh, and sort of said we have to do something about it. We have to uh, introduce everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being on the, on the, on the call. Really uh, uh, great potential in uh, these partnerships. All right, thanks. And you can see our, our mission there at NHSA. Um, next, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome um, Sheral from the National Coalition for Campus Children's Centers. This is Mary. I'm sorry, the, uh, Mary. <laughs> that's okay. This is Mary Scarafa, and I'm actually the past president of the National Coalition for Campus Children's Centers. And as you can see, our mission there, we are a nonprofit educational membership organization supporting excellence in programs for young children in communities of higher learning by providing opportunities for leadership, professional development, research, networking, and advocacy. We do represent more than 600 universities and college campus centers from across the United States and Canada. And typically our members are faculty, directors, administrators, and teachers from centers that have diverse organizational fundings and diverse program structures within higher ed institutions. So I'm, I'm thrilled that we're a part of this webinar today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and next, sorry about that, uh, now Sheral from the, the Higher Education Alliance of Advocates for Students with Children. Hello, and thank you. Um, as you said, my name is Sherell Arnold, and I am currently the director of the Children's Enrichment Center at Grand Valley State University, but I'm here today as the board chair of HEAF, the Higher Education Alliance of Advocates for Students with Children. I'm happy to be a part of this webinar on behalf of the young children and families that all of us represent. I want to acknowledge our founding institutions of HEAF, and those institutions are Baldwin Wallace College, Endicott College, Michigan State University, the Ohio State University, and University of Minnesota Twin Cities. You can move to the next one. HEASC is a national membership organization. As you can read up here, our mission is pretty simple. It's to promote college graduation of student parents by directly supporting students and the professionals that serve them. So again, I'm very excited to say that we have educators, legislators, researchers, administrators that are all part of this work that we're doing. Our work is grounded in retention and academic success for those students that are pregnant and parenting. I encourage all of you to reach out um, to me if you are someone who wants to encourage, empower, or inspire our student parents to be successful, then please don't hesitate to get connected with HEASC. And you can reach me at arnoldsh at gvsu.edu. And thanks again, um, Barbara and your team, for inviting us to be here today. Thank you. Um, next, I'll turn us to, to Barbara Galt, who will tell us uh, some of the context for why this is an exciting opportunity to partner and uh, the need for child care among college students. Thanks, Emily. Can you hear me? Now I can. Mm -hmm. OK, great. It is wonderful to have the opportunity to talk with all of you on the phone today. At the Institute for Women's Policy Research, we have had a project going for about five years now called the Student Parent Success Initiative that we founded with the knowledge that there's nothing more powerful you can do to end poverty among single-headed households and low-income families than helping them access post-secondary education. And the project is designed to look at ways that we can support students with children who are going to college. Uh, next slide. And we've done quite a bit of research on the population of students in college who have children. And we've 
been quite surprised, and people are often very surprised to hear how many and what a high proportion of college students have children. Uh, nearly 5 million college students are raising dependent children, and uh, the proportion of students with children varies um, across different types of institutions. That's what this slide shows. Um, each of the lines shows uh, the proportion of students with children. The top one is at private for-profit institutions. So there you can see that uh, those institutions are, are the most likely to have student parents in attendance. Um, next you can see in the blue line shows the proportion of, of students with children over time in community colleges. And about 30% of community college students have kids. Um, and then the blue, the blue diamonds show you all institution types. And overall, about 26% of college students have dependent children. Um, Four-year colleges and institutions are least likely to have students with children, but they still have a pretty high proportion, um, approaching 20% in private, not-for-profit, four-year colleges and institutions. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is a slide that shows how much the likelihood of having a child while you're in college differs by race and ethnicity. And we think that this is important because one of the primary goals and missions of higher education institutions is to promote um, equity, social equity on the basis of race and ethnicity and income, and to really le level the playing field and to give everyone equal opportunities to succeed in our economy. And what you can see here is that communities of color are much, much more likely to have children while they're in college than other students. So, um, for, for example, um, more than 50% of black women in community college have children while they're attending school. So we think that colleges and universities that take the equity imperative seriously do have a responsibility to help their students think about um, the needs they have as parents as well as, as students, just in the same way that many employers have come to look at work-life balance as an important part of helping their employees succeed at work. Um, so it's true that many students, a very large proportion of students, need help with work-life balance supports like childcare to help them succeed at school. And that paying a lot more attention to this and improving our childcare resources can really help us meet our national goals toward improving the rates of credentialing and higher educational attainment, especially among low-income families. Next slide, please. Um, so this is a slide that I find especially disturbing and one that we need to try to do something about. And that is that even though we see that such a high growing proportion of uh, students in college have kids, the proportion of colleges and universities that have child care centers on campus has been declining year by year. And you know, we can all understand, I'm sure, some of the reasons that this is happening, um, given, given the challenging financial climate that many colleges and universities are operating in. But we think that if there were more awareness of the need for child care, that it wouldn't be the first thing to be cut when colleges and universities need to need to cut back their spending and their expenditures. And so we see that you know there's a need to um, expand available child care. And we thought that this funding opportunity to create partnerships between Early Head Start and other kinds of child care centers may be an opportunity to help um, shift the direction <laughs> of this graph and um, start increasing supply again. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Institute for Women's Policy Research, along with the Women's Foundation of Mississippi, recently did a survey of women community college students in the state of Mississippi. And one of the things we asked about was uh, what the, the parents in the survey were using for child care. And we found that the vast majority of them used uh, family care 
um, for the majority of their child care needs. And to me, that raises the issue that you know students that don't have that kind of family support uh, may not have the option to attend community college. And um, and also, you know, we're we're putting a lot of burden on extended families to support students while they're in college, which could have a negative impact on their own ability to work and invest in their own economic future. Next slide, please. Um, we also found that among the respondents in that survey that um, nearly half of the students with children felt that they couldn't get the kind of quality care they wanted because it was too expensive and that um, find, finding child care that they could pay for was one of their biggest financial challenges. So um, with that, I'm very excited to hear from programs that have made Early Head Start and, and college partnerships work and to think about how this funding opportunity might allow us to create more opportunities for students with children. Thanks. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and there's, there's Barbara's contact information, too, if you have additional questions um, about this, this work. Um, oh, there we go. I'll leave that up for a second. Um, and so now, before we move on to the, to the examples from the, the field, I'll just spend a minute talking about what Early Head Start is and, and what the funding opportunity in particular right now is, because it's a little different than any that we've seen before in Early Head Start. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Early Head Start, it has been around for about 20 years now. Head Start was originally created in the 1965 to serve primarily three and four-year-olds, and at the time five-year-olds before they entered school. But Early Head Start was added to serve um, pregnant women and children from birth until their third birthday, until they were old enough for Head Start. Um, it is broader than sort of the typical model for child care. It includes not only um, comprehensive early childhood education and development services, but individual, fit part fit individual partnerships with families to help them focus on developing relationships with children and um, moving and, oh, sorry. Uh, and moving towards self-sufficiency, uh, community partnerships, um, parent administration through the policy council, and really deep comprehensive services for the entire family in terms of health, dental health, mental health, access to those kinds of services in their communities, support accessing housing or uh, food subsidies or other uh, programs based on the family's individual needs. Um, so it may be different than what you traditionally thought of if you have a, um, a more typical child care site, um, but worth exploring and often can provide additional uh, resources through partnership. Um, in particular, it's worth noting that in order to enroll, families typically have to be below the poverty line or have a child with a disability, a child in foster care, um, be homeless or otherwise meet the at-risk criteria that the, the local program has defined. Um, the partnerships in particular uh, work in various ways, but have been around since Early Head Start was created. Currently, they reach about 6,500 infants and toddlers per year, but the new funding opportunity could add as many as 40,000 slots across the country. Um, which is part of why we're so excited to think about how to do this, um, both through scaling up what already works, but also thinking about what kinds of innovation we can create, what kinds of new partnerships can best serve eligible families where they are um, and where they need help. Um, and research has shown that these partnerships raise quality for children and families. They also expand access to high quality care, uh, most effectively when planning is done thoughtfully and there's strong communication. Uh, and just a similar sort of dour statistic uh, to match some of Barbara's. Um, currently, Early Head Start is only funded to reach 4% of infants and toddlers in poverty. Um, we are looking forward to the expansion uh, to that number. Um, and the Child Care Development Block Grant, which is another subsidy for child care, uh, reaches about 17% of eligible children uh, birth to 18. So there is a high need for high quality, affordable care. 
or birth to 12, not sure on CCDF. Uh, we, we work with the infants and toddlers here. <laughs> um, the partnership models are locally designed. You'll hear that term come up often in early Head Start and Head Start. Um, the local community, the leadership of the program with the parents and the board have a lot of flexibility in terms of how they implement the standards that are required. Um, typically, they include early Head Start grantee partnering with either a family child care home, a center-based child care setting, possibly on a campus, possibly a standalone, um, sometimes within a YMCA or United Way. There are various models. Um, and, and often with more than one site. Uh, depending on the local design, the contributions to the partnership from the Early Head Start program might include support in meeting the performance standards, identified slots in the partnership setting. Typically what will happen is if there's a classroom of, say, 17 children, well, it would be many, it would, if we're talking about four-year-olds, it could be 17 children, not for infants and toddlers. Um, and a few of those slots would be set aside and fully funded with the Early Head Start dollars. And then the partner would be required to meet the, the Early Head Start standards for things like curriculum, assessment, um, brushing teeth after meals, things that would apply to all the children in the setting, uh, potentially raising quality depending on what resources uh, were available previously. And then in addition, the children who were directly funded by Early Head Start would receive all of the wraparound services um, provided either by center staff or by the Early Head Start staff, depending on how the model was developed. Um, so the Early Head Start program might provide comprehensive services staff, teaching staff, supervisory or coaching staff. Um, professional development is often offered to all partners, um, materials and resources, and then direct financial support for child. Um, and You'll hear today from two program models that are very different from one another. Um, they don't, uh, neither of them is one model that we think anyone needs to take wholesale, but we think that they're, they've been very successful in what they've done and how they've used local resources to meet local needs. Um, and that's what we want to encourage everyone to think about and to consider what you might be able to take from these examples um, to think locally about what might best fit your needs. Uh, the, this particular new opportunity that's out right now, you can, the grants are out for application uh, for the next couple months, um, first began this push uh, about a year and a half ago already. Um, President Obama declared his commitment to expanding early learning opportunities, um, and one of the prongs of that effort was through these Early Head Start Child Care Partnerships. Um, You'll see down there that in June, we finally saw the official funding opportunity announcement um, for $500 million uh, to be distributed across the country. Uh, and those are to be used both for uh, partnerships and for expansion. Um, the expansion option is described in the funding opportunity announcement, or the FOA, as being primarily for areas that are so rural, there are limited partnership opportunities or other uh, particular areas that can justify why they're choosing not to partner. But the, the priority, as the administration has expressed it, really is to, to build early Head Start child care partnerships with these new investments. Um, and they, the, the new programs are required to leverage funding by having at least a quarter of their children receiving child care subsidy um, and, and building those funding streams together to really enhance quality for all the children. Uh, these are just some bullets, and, and I'll send the slides around later if you're interested in seeing them. So I won't read these all to you right now, but this just gives you a little bit of an overview of what the new opportunity is if you haven't had a chance to, to look at it or if you're not from the early Head Start world. Um, there are about two more months for folks to apply. If, a, if out of this today you have a successful conversation with your local Early Head Start program and you've designed something you think will work, the application only goes in once and only from the lead agency, um, which would typically be the existing grantee. Um, the new funding and center-based settings can serve children from birth up until their third birthday. Um, and we really encourage you to go to grants.gov and look at the full, uh, the full funding opportunity announcement. It's, it's long and dense, but really can, can get you 
more detail than I'm giving you in these five minutes. Um, you can also access additional resources and past webinars that we've held specific to partnerships at earlyheadstartchildcare.nhsa.org. Um, and with that, uh, I'm excited to turn you over to Sandy and Ainsley, who are joining us today representing both sides of a partnership in Minnesota. Hi, this is Ainsley. Our partnership uh, between Civic League, and Day Nurse, Civic League Day Nursery and Head Start here in Rochester, Minnesota began in 1995. Civic League is a center-based child care facility and we have two locations. One of our locations is at the Rochester Community and Technical College. We're on the property but it's an independent child care facility. It's not run by the college. Our partnership started in 1995 because at that point we had many children who were participating in Head Start and during the day the school bus would come, they, if the bus would pick them up, take them to Head Start and then they would return back to the center a little later that day. And we were having a little bit of a disruption and it was, it was hard for the children leaving during the day and coming back and with meal times and nap times. So we wanted to have something that was a little more smoother uh, fewer transitions for those children. And at that point, we and Head Start collaborated and discussed joining and forming this partnership. And the partnership is at our site, that's at the community college. This facility is open to the public. Even though it's on the property of the college, it's open to the public. Half of our families, or even just over half of our families, are either students themselves at the college or their faculty. We have several people who come into the center who really utilize that, that site. We have work-study students, we have volunteers, we have practicum students. And with the child development program at the community college, this has been a wonderful resource for them to use to be able to come in and get some of that first-hand experience in a live child care study and that's up and running. I met with our chancellor of the college about a year ago and during that meeting he stated to me that he said Ainsley we the college are not in the business of child care and he stated that they have no interest in being in the business of child care and with that he expressed his long-term goals of Civic League remaining on the property but not being run by the college. He was much more interested in having an outside child care organization run that rather than having the college be responsible for that. Sandy is going to talk about the next slide which talks about the benefits of having Civic League and the Head Start partnership. And I just want to say that I just really appreciate all the people that went before Ainsley and I that got this partnership together and we are the um, we're just really happy to be able to continue to support it. Um, the, the main benefit is that the partnership does support families going to school and that the children have access to full day, full year care with that continuity of care that Ainsley spoke to about the reason that they first developed the partnership and that it's in a safe educational setting. Um, I think one of the key benefits for the partnership is that additional resources and support are given the families through monthly home visits. I had a Head Start parent talk to me just um, recently about how she was so excited she had completed her nursing degree and owned a house now. And when she started in Head Start about four years before that happened, she said she didn't even know that she could dream that. So I think one of the key things that the Head Start staff do is they come alongside the parents and they help them identify what their dreams are and what their goals are for the future and then they support them in achieving the goals. Um, another thing that happens is that the um, monthly parent meetings are hosted by Head Start and they're open to all the families in the setting. The students have grant and scholarship opportunities that will really help them to assist um, with the expenses for child care. And we did not start with this model, but over the past couple of years, we started having a Head Start teacher co-teach in the classroom. 
And that's been really beneficial for both of our programs. It's beneficial to the children because they get the benefit of having two teachers besides the other support staff in the classroom. And um, it really helps um, um, both, both the teachers in having a partner to really help move the curriculum forward and the individual, individualization forward for the children in the classroom. We also have um, coaches that go into the classroom and coach um, the whole education team in the classroom. And they're coaching on the use of child assessment data in individualizing for children and setting up small groups. They do the class, which is a tool for measuring the uh, teacher-child interaction and then supporting the staff in, um, in goals and in improving that. Besides looking at other strategies within the classroom to really help the progress of the children. Um, I think one of the most important parts of that is that the staff then have someone to support them in really looking at the data that we're collecting on progress children are making across all the domains. And so it really helps them enhance, enhance the progress for the children. There are professional development opportunities for all staff. And it's really interesting. Well, the Head Start performance standards ensure the comprehensive, high-quality care that Emily was talking about. But this partnership has been going on for so long that the staff at the site really don't know, is this a Head Start performance standard? Is this part of what our child care program is promoting? It's just become the way that they do business. And for example, brushing teeth. That's just part of what they do, and all the children participate every day. And there's other examples of that, too. Um, in Minnesota, um, the quality rating system is called Parent Aware. And because Civic League Day Nursery is partnering with Head Start in this classroom, they receive an accelerated Parent Aware rating of four stars. And that helps um, the program access a higher um, uh, child care assistance rate for, that, for children who are enrolled in that classroom. In addition to the other benefits, um, there are mental health observations. Our mental health consultant comes into the classroom. In the past, when there has been some needed equipment replaced, then we've been able to um, assist with replacing the equipment and supplies, assist with um, field trips. And then we also um, have an arrangement where um, the Child Care Center can bill the Head Start program for um, planning time and other time that's, that we're um, requesting is, that's over and above their child care um, duties. So I just, I just really appreciate the partnership. And I just want to say that um, I think the key to the partnership is that we have a common goal in, in that we want to, we're both there to support the families going to school and providing high quality um, setting for the children. But also, relationships are so key. I'm just really fortunate that, um, that in the time that I've been here in this agency, that there have been um, the, the leadership of the child care center has been very interested in working together on how we can improve this. And the relationships are so key. So I just, I just want to. Um, stress that point. All right. Thank you both so much. Uh, we really appreciate hearing, hearing what you've accomplished. Um, next, we'll turn to an example from Maine that you'll hear quite different, and yet also an example of um, how to think about bridging the, the Early Head Start program and community or community college uh, child care. Um, and with that, I'll welcome Jean Bridges from PenQuest. Hi, um, it's great to join the uh, webinar and it's really exciting to hear other people that are thinking about this or involved in this. Uh, we've found it to be an extremely um, great um, partnership that we've had. Um, I didn't happen to put a slide in around our mission, but I did want to touch on it. Our actual mission, it's quite short, but it's assisting individuals and families in preventing, reducing, or eliminating poverty in their lives and through partnerships engages the community in addressing economic and social needs. And I think listening to the previous um, presenters, um, it's it really, I think, while this is Penquist's mission, I don't think it's 
Um, probably very far from a lot of Head Start and early Head Start program missions. Uh, we really are fully engaged with the community uh, and we are serving a net risk population. So I think this kind of a partnership is, is pretty uh, uh, representational of, of pulling that work together um, to make good things happen. So this picture here, um, Whoops, <laughs> the picture, just um, a little bit of reflection, the, the middle section, kind of the middle height, um, that was the building that existed um, when we started to have a dialogue um, with the uh, college about, um, and it's, um, if you go to the next slide, uh, in terms of back in uh, 2000, we approached the, the college about, could you help us out with uh, some CDA courses that we needed to have uh, for our uh, Head Start employees? and um, that's kind of where it all started. This, by the way, is um, one, only one of six of our multi-classroom uh, facilities in the greater Bangor, Maine area. Um, but we're set up quite similar uh, in the other ones, but this is, this is a, a wonderful partnership that um, really um, evolved over time. And so I think going through this history, we'll, we'll, you'll get a sense of uh, it started out with one uh, level of seeking help and it evolved into something much greater over time and, and not all at once. Uh, so they um, reached, reached out and, and did help us out with some CDA classes and that actually started um, their focus on developing a two-year program uh, for early childhood. So that was really exciting to see that by reaching out to them, um, greater things happened uh, on the early childhood program side. The actual center was built on new construction, uh, as you saw from the picture. Um, that happened in 2003, and the original um, center served a total of 32 children. Uh, we had eight infants, eight toddlers, and 16 preschool children. Um, predominantly, uh, well, probably two-thirds of those children were Head Start or early Head Start eligible. Some of them had full-day, full-year uh, services wrapped with them, and some of them were part-day slots. We, we have a blend in all of our classrooms, or a good many of our classrooms. We have options available. Um, but uh, probably about 50% of the enrollees were uh, Head Start or Early Head Start eligible. Oftentimes, those Head Start uh, eligible families were also students uh, within the, the college um, there. Next slide. When, um, when we first started with the college, uh, the very first year, uh, the early childhood program actually operated the center. Uh, and as it was mentioned um, earlier by uh, the Minnesota program, um, they found pretty early on that their expertise was in helping in, uh, people to learn about quality early childhood, but not necessarily running a center. And so we sat down after that first year and they uh, asked if we would take over the center in terms of day-to-day uh, -day operations and actually run it uh, and they that we would work collaboratively on, on making sure that we uh, satisfied what each of us needed in, in that dual partnership. So, it, but, um, it, so after that we, we totally you know, ran, ran the center. In 2008, uh, we had an anonymous um, business inquiry uh, at the time to say, is it possible to, uh, we like so much uh, the quality of child care that's happening at that facility, would you be willing to, they went to the college, would you be willing to expand it? We would like to have um, access to that kind of quality. Uh, it ended up over time revealing that it was a regional hospital in the area and they did, uh, in fact, we, Penquist agreed to uh, enter into a conversation about um, expanding access uh, to the center. And through the uh, collaboration with the hospital joining and making it a three-way partnership, we were able to double the capacity from 32 to 64. Um, of course, the hospital was asking for some uh, benefits that would come out of that, and that was would we increase the hours of operation so that we could accommodate the hospital shifts uh, and in turn for um, that, uh, having a certain number of dedicated enrollment slots, uh, they fully funded the renovation uh, costs that were involved and they also equipped 
the two new classrooms because I said I don't have any funding to uh, expand uh, to this degree. And um, as we all know, uh, if you don't put it together thoughtfully and well and have it well supported, um, you, you don't get off to a very good start and none of us want that. We are here for quality and so the hospital fully uh, funded the equipment that went into all of those, um, those new classrooms. Also, uh, it's expensive to, to operate um, a high quality child care and uh, we have um, the benefit of because of our quality status and Maine's quality rating system, uh, we are the highest level um, that's achievable in Maine and that's a step four on the QRIS system. Also, Maine had developed probably six or seven years ago um, a benefit of a double child care tax credit for any family, not just Head Start or Early Head Start, but any family that participates in a Step 4 uh, quality child care program uh, is eligible for um, a double child care tax credit off the top of their tax uh, at the end of uh, the year. And we cooperate with giving out those license numbers and data uh, so they can officially file that with their income tax. And then um, we're thinking in terms of uh, your first introductory slide where you were talking about the family that was affected by sequestration cuts. Uh, and we too, as all Head Starts and early Head Starts, were faced with that sequestration cut. And uh, I have to say that um, this next piece, which is the 2012 um, Part Day uh, Inclusive Child Care Classroom uh, was established. And as we were cutting um, classrooms because of the sequestration, our local LEA, which in Maine is called CDS program, they provide all of the um, they provide all of the special ed uh, services within the state of Maine uh, for the zero to five year olds, and they um, um, actually took over the, the salaries and the um, personnel costs for the people that I was needing to to cut. So it was really a great um, um, partnership contribution as far as that was concerned. My screen went down. <laughs> um, so um, in 2012, uh, not only did we, uh, what we were able to add to the, the existing mix was we had full day, full year child care, zero to five years of age. We were able to include, uh, create uh, an inclusive classroom, one that we were losing uh, because of sequestration. We shifted it to a, a, a morning ses session of 10 children and an afternoon session of 10 children. Uh, and um, that, as I said, the staff were paid for by the local LEA. So in, in those classrooms, um, there's a greater uh, child care, uh, staff to child ratio, so there's greater individualized uh, attention. Ten of, of those ten children, six of them are typically developing. Four children have um, IEPs recognized um, by um, the local LEA and are eligible for special services. What it allowed um, to happen was it really helped to bring in um, those, those additional funds. We had highly trained professionals that have um, special education expertise. Uh, and it allowed us also within the, the building, the child care facility, allowed us to offer a continuum of services for children from um, fully inclusive uh, classrooms where a child might have a special need but has a, a greater number of children participating in the, in, in the uh, regular classroom or it has the ability to have a, a child who might be more involved, needing more uh, intensive supports uh, in a smaller uh, classroom size of 10 children and they could transition either in or out of um, th those settings as their IEPs um, um, uh, deal with and, and address their uh, particular special needs. Um, so next slide. Uh, features of the uh, Memorandum of Understanding that, that was developed uh, between Penquist and the, the community college was that uh, they clearly wanted the setting to be of high quality because it was is it a lab school for their uh, students who are going through their two-year early childhood program. Uh, so they wanted to make sure that it was NAEYC accredited and that was, that was maintained throughout the um, uh, 
contract that we hold with them. Teachers uh, in this particular facility uh, must hold a bachelor's degree in early childhood, and assistants must have associate's degrees, and classroom aides must have a minimum of a CDA. We have a lot of student practicum placements that occur across all of the classrooms, and, and as, as, as you can see, a nice spread for the college students. They have infants through five years of age, and there's also some concentrated work and, and opportunity to learn about serving children with special needs. Our mentor teachers uh, receive training credits from the college so that um, in, in Maine, if you're a quality uh, child care program, you have to uh, assure that you are uh, achieving 40 uh, hours of training a year in order to maintain your uh, quality status. Uh, this practice of mentoring um, supervising teachers that are in this building get uh, additional hours and credit for the work that they're doing with those practicum students. They also have access to professional training opportunities within the college themselves if they're looking at picking up some additional coursework. And um, there's a beautiful early childhood library for not only the children uh, on, right on campus, but there's adult um, resources and books for for our teachers to, to use. We have wonderful uh, meeting space that we're able to have not only for this team um, within the building that is employed within the building, but um, the, the facility offers us an opportunity to have uh, group meetings for our entire um, uh, child development staff on occasion. So uh, we really have a lot of benefits that go back and forth between uh, the college and Pencourt. Next slide. And this one, uh, uh, it did allow us, as far as benefits for children and families, it, it, we have, it's extremely ex expensive to, to deliver comprehensive uh, early childhood services to uh, families and to children. And oftentimes we've had flat funding over a number of years. This is really, these kinds of partnerships have really allowed us to take scarce resources and blend them um, to make sure that we keep that quality programming going. And in the end, it actually, I have to say, even if we had gotten increased dollars and not had to think of some of these uh, strategies, this really, I think, has made a much better um, uh, offering by bringing the specialized talents that, that um, we're able to bring by doing such a, a, a wonderful partnership. Professional talents were broadened by bringing in this kind of a partnership, and I think one of the great, wonderful aspects of, of this partnership is it offers universal access. Not only universal access as far as socioeconomic mix, because in this particular example of our partnership, we have low-income uh, Head Start and early Head Start uh, enrollees, but we have children with special needs, and we also have, um, if, you, if the community has access to this, we have doctors, nurses, um, so we have the total spectrum in terms of socioeconomic mix, and I, I think that's been really beneficial to, to have available. The families who are seeking employment or school opportunities um, knew that they could have access to uh, quality and the stability of this, our services that are there. We close down only three days um, a year for professional training, uh, and we uh, only close uh, for um, the typical holidays, uh, and we, it is rare, very rare. Um, we never close for storm day because our families depend on us for um, that, that care so they can go to school and work. And I mentioned before, families receive a double tax uh, credit from the state of Maine because of our rating, and we also uh, receive a higher, quality, a higher uh, bump or reimbursement from the state of Maine for the subsidies. Um, that families bring as um, their subsidy from um, the State of Maine Child Care Voucher Program. And the campus location is extremely uh, convenient for families to enroll uh, in college classes, and so they, uh, it really is an appealing location for our students, and it, it removes that barrier for some families that uh, just it's, it's difficult to go to school and work, and uh, it, it removes one barrier to make uh, everything co convenient right on the campus. And Eastern Maine Community College, I didn't mention it here, but Eastern Maine Community College also has an hour and a half away from Bangor an outreach office, and they were able to obtain a, a bond from the state of Maine six or seven years ago and built a second um, 
lab school location for us uh, for one of the outreach locations in East Millinocket. So uh, it's, it's grown over the years uh, from a, a beginning little um, request for help um, into something that is uh, phenomenally um, beneficial to not only Head Start and Early Head Start, but to the community and to the family. So I, I'm ever so appreciative of, of um, as a previous presenter mentioned, the relationships are, are so key uh, in order to uh, reach that common goal that we have, which is uh, making sure that we deliver quality. So it's been, uh, it's wonderful. And that next slide is, is really kind of just a summary uh, I won't go through all of it because uh, it's kind of said it in verbally and whatever, but that just kind of summarizes um, the, the benefits of the elements that each of the um, partners brings to making this, this wonderful partnership happen. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Jean. Um, I'll, let me just check. So I'll just show you the slide and then I'll go back and, and leave uh, Jean's last slide up for a minute so you can read it. Um, if you do have a question at this point, you can either raise your hand or go ahead and type your question in the question box, which sometimes works faster depending on how the audio is working. Um, but I'll, I'll let you take a look at that last slide. And uh, by all means, uh, go ahead and type your questions, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next uh, seven minutes or so. All right. Okay, I see. Uh, here's our first question. How are you working with the college around parents who are attending the college? Are there any strategies that you work with in terms of the community colleges to track the student parents' performance? That's for Jean or Sandy or Amy. This is Ainsley in Minnesota. We don't necessarily work with the college on tracking the performance, um, but one thing that we learned very early on, just a very important lesson for us and for anybody who's interested in doing this, is to be flexible. Because the parents who are going back to school each semester, or in certain cases each quarter, their schedules change. So the needs that they need the, for child care are changing either quarterly or semesterly. Um, but as far as tracking the performance of the families, we don't do that. There are certain grants that some of the families have received, and I know there's requirements with those grants that they have to keep their GPA at a certain level or be maintaining a certain number of credits each term. This is Jean. We have a tracking system for uh, family data in terms of um, outcomes, and one of those is, is uh, achieving higher education or uh, educational goals. It would take me a bit of time to extrapolate out this particular center and how many might be students, because we don't necessarily break it down that way, but that is part of our family tracking data. Thanks. And this um, is Sandy. It's also part of our family tracking data in our Head Start program. Um, someone asked um, if they're looking to partner, would, they, would the local Head Start need to apply for the grant or could the child facility on behalf of the Head Start they want to partner with? Um, whoever applies for the grant becomes an early Head Start grantee. So if you're, in, unless you're trying to become the early Head Start organization yourself, it's the existing early Head Start that would put in the application, but certainly that should be written in partnership. Um, and really carefully designed together. Um, another question asks, did she understand that the current FOA um, would not likely be a promising potential source of funds to renovate a public university building to create a new child care to serve low-income student parents? Um, so there are startup funds available through this grant opportunity that include construction. Um, so there, there is the potential for some initial renovations. Um, they don't guarantee that you'll get all the startup funds you request, so it's a, definitely a, a conversation worth having and looking at what that budget would look like. Um, but it is a possibility. Um, 
I think that answers that if it doesn't ask it. <laughs> um, question asks, um, if our local Head Start agency is not that interested in applying, but as a college child and family center, we are interested in applying, is there a way to apply for this grant? Uh, yes, you can apply yourself to be a new Early Head Start grantee through the Early Head Start trial through the Early Head Start expansion option. Um, and you can, I would encourage you to read the FOA and, and get a sense of, of what the options are there. Um, if you're looking for a lead agency, if you go to the Office of Head Start, which is the, the federal uh, administrators of the, the Head Start and Early Head Start program in the US Department of Health and Human Services, they have a locator right on the front page of their website where you can put in your zip code and find the nearest uh, Head Start and Early Head Start agency and reach out to them. Uh, <laughs> this next question is one of the trickier ones we've had uh, from a lot of different folks. Uh, do you know what it means in the FOA where it states that the grantee must ensure that children retain services regardless of their subsidy status? Does that mean ensure early Head Start services continue? Um, yes, but there has been no particular guidance yet from the Office of Head Start about how that should work. It's included in the questions that we've submitted um, to hopefully have added to their FAQ on their website about how they imagine this working, uh, but the details remain to be seen. Um, This is a question, and, and Jean and Sandy and Ainsley, you guys can take a stab at this, but I'm not sure that either of your partnerships work this way. Um, would there be any particular advantages to having the community college be the lead applicant? I, I would think if you already had a comp competent lead agency that it would be difficult to be splitting that lead but um, this is Sandy. I, I'm just thinking that the the requirements around governance might be a little difficult in a within a, a higher education setting. Thanks. Um, a question for Ainsley: uh, How do you monitor available positions for children of students if partnering with other institutions? such as hospitals or colleges whose children also attend. Um, she says, my experience is when I was seeking childcare at the university, there were no spots for my children. I was told I'd be on a waiting list um, because spaces were, were needed for faculty. Um, so if, I guess for, for either program, do you, are there ways that you can prioritize enrolling students or so the that, children? That's, kind of, that's a complex issue that we do run into. We do have a waiting list for our facility. And since we are on the property of the community college, they have some requirements in our contract with them, but we also have some of our own requirements. So some of the requirements are that Head Start families will get the first, first available spot. Um, the community college current enrolled families will also get top priority. Alumni of the community college will get priority. So we have a couple different areas that will get priority. Um, for us, it's also important, since we do have a waiting list, to keep all of those spots, have all of those spots filled. So we never turn away. We're, we're really not going to turn away a family. Um, if we've contacted the families on our waiting list to meet the eligibility requirements for Head Start, but they're not maybe old enough or they're not ready at this point, we're not going to necessarily hold that spot for six months or the year when they would be ready for it. We will then go to the next family who is in need of that opening. So it is a little bit of a balancing act, and we have our waiting list set up, and we have specific questions asking um, if they are connected with the community college, if they're seeking that Head Start, the Head Start resources. So as we're going through our waiting list when we have those openings, we, we're aware of that. 
but that, then, that, that can be a little tricky sometimes. And at Penquist, um, it, it is tricky, but over the last, I've been director for 14 years now, and throughout the last 10, 14 years, um, I have worked pretty aggressively at, at uh, making all of our um, child care Grand Valley State Head Start, early Head Start this locations. Is Tom Toss, and we're glad you called. Someone will be with you shortly. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, I've worked pretty aggressively at making all of our multiple uh, classroom locations that do Head Start, child care, early Head Start mix. Uh, so just as my slide here had said, about 50% of the population in world report. School are help Head Start and Early Head Start eligible. So I have 50% of my slots available for the community. So when uh, hospital clientele are seeking services, there are community slots that I know are dedicated to community slots. Now the college um, requests for services for if they're students, oftentimes they may be eligible for Head Start and Early Head Start. So they could either go in a community slot or a Head Start, Early Head Start slot. So unlike my early years where a center was only uh, Head Start eligible or only Early Head Start and that's all we served, we've moved away from that and that's helped us over the years to diversify our funding and cost allocate uh, expenses so that we um, are able to be more flexible as funding goes up and down, uh, as it often can, across federal and state um, funding sources. Thank you. All right. Um, we have one last question for today. Um, this woman asks, housing is a big need for student parents in our community. I'd like to have a community housing project for student parents, single parents, open for students who are enrolled in any of our three colleges. Would this program be a source of funding for an early childhood and early childhood education and child care component as part of the project. Um, so I know that there are actually um, some early Head Start and Head Start programs that are run out of housing authorities. Do, we, do any of you have familiar, familiarity with that? I, I do at Penquist. In fact, um, in 2000, uh, we were approached by uh, Bangor Housing Authority uh, to build us a brand new facility. We actually had um, been within the housing authority's um, footprint, if you will, uh, in the community uh, in kind of old renovated apartments uh, to deliver our Head Start program. And they, Bangor Housing Authority, uh, obtained federal funding and built a dedicated child care facility that serves 80 children. Uh, and we moved into that in, in 2000. Just this past year, across the river in Brewer, the Brewer Housing Authority approached us. They got they were one of five communities across the nation that obtained housing authority funding, uh, and they built. Uh, and we just moved in in uh, December, uh, built a small childcare facility that serves. We operate it. It, it serves uh, infants zero to uh, five years. That, of age, zero to three. It's only two, uh, three classrooms. It's a small facility. On the other half of the building is the higher ed part, where community college, uh, adult ed, um, all of these adult uh, supports are available so that the adults are on one half of the building and the child care is on the other half of the building. And again, some of those children that are enrolled in those Classrooms are eligible for Head Start and Early Head Start, but some of them are community in what we would consider over income. But again, I cost allocate um, the, all of the funding based on enrollment uh, numbers and what type of uh, program they're participating in, uh, and it has worked beautifully. It, and I do believe that it does reduce uh, the barriers uh, for families to be able to go to school and or work. Uh, or go to school and then go to work um, because it's a continuum uh, on the self-sufficiency scale. So it's been a phenomenal partnership, um, very similar to the community college one. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think that we have used up our time. Um, I will circulate the slides to all our participants later. And uh, I know several of you have asked uh, for 
email contact for different folks who are on. I think they're sort of sprinkled through the slides, but I'll make sure that that's all there. Um, so Mary, Sherelle, uh, Barbara, any final words before we close? No, but thank you um, again. And like I said, on behalf of He Ask, I would definitely encourage anyone that wants to join our effort with this organization to please um, look us up. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, thanks so much to the folks who partnered to help make this possible today and to, to bring everybody on the, on the webinar together to, to think about these issues. Um, and if you have questions about making this happen or reaching out to your local programs, uh, feel free to get in touch with me or anyone else. Thank you so much.